Uh, this morning we have four items um, that um, that we're going to be uh, ha uh, discussing. But item number, we're going to go out of order. Item number three is the uh, FY23 supplemental appropriation for the apparatus replacement program. Everything else on today's agenda deals with the, in, in one way or another, with policing. So we're going to take the uh, fire service out of order so that they can get right back out on the street, Chief. We uh, appreciate that. And, uh, and with that, I'm going to turn to... Unless, unless council member uh, Lukey has anything to add, we're going to turn to Ms. Ms. Farag. Nope, let's get going. Okay, Ms. Farag, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Chair Katz mentioned, this is the Apparatus Program CIP and Supplemental Appropriation. It's appropriating $4.2 million to the replacement of fire and rescue vehicles um, to ensure that they are, are replaced in a timely manner. And the reason for this appropriation is due to ongoing supply chain issues the build times for these vehicles have increased. Uh, traditionally, they're about 10 to 14 months, and now they're 18 to 30 months from the date of order. And there's also been additional cost inflation for the replacement vehicles. It has greatly exceeded prior levels over the past several years. Um, the funding does have to be appropriated so that they can enter into a purchase order for this um, equipment. It does not increase the cost of the overall project, and council staff's recommending approval. Thank you. Uh, Chief, did you have anything to add? Uh, Susan does a great job outlining it, and as the uh, components there, is apparatus is taking much longer to see here versus the, the order time, and this is a collaboration between OMB and FRS to And, and I have no problem doing it this way. My only concern is, and they, every business always stay in business, but what happens if uh, we prepay and that, are we bonded in any way? How does that work? So I'm going to outline that to, to Alan or Gary, and I want to be clear, we're not prepaying. So. Yes, good morning. Uh, so we don't pay for apparatus until it's delivered, okay. and there is a performance bond that, that is led as part of the contract. Which is my question. Yeah, yeah so it would please. be fair to say it's an encumbrance not an actual transfer of capital, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? If, if not, are we we are in agreement that we should have some apparatus here in Montgomery County. Okay, so, so just be clear, that's a 3-0 vote to recommend approval. Yes. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you for being clear that that is correct. I have a feeling if anyone disagreed with that, they would tell me right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for doing what you're doing. Okay, so now we're going to go back sort of in order, and uh, we're going to go to number one and number two, I guess, are in the right. same packet. Please. These are both for the police department. They are also supplemental appropriations and CIP amendments. The first one to discuss is the 6th District Police Station. Um, this amendment is adding about $5.9 million to the project, and total funding will go from about $31.9 million to $37.8 million if approved, and the source of the funds is GEO bonds. This project's been in the CIP since 2002. It was first recommended as a project when the police department expanded from five to six districts. It has been deferred over two decades. Um, they are currently in lease space up in Montgomery Village. That lease ends December 2025, and there's been a push and a, and a request to ensure that this building is built and ready for occupation before that lease ends to avoid additional problems of, you know, the, the, the the landlord's not required to renew this lease. It could cause other problems. And so the goal was to have this project finished by December 2025. Um, it gets the third largest number of calls in the county, generally behind 3D and 4D. Those are Silver Spring and Wheaton. Um, this supplemental appropriation, again, is $5.9 million related to cost increases in the supply chain challenges and equipment costs. And it's required, again, to be appropriated in order to award the contract. Um, DGS is here today, but they've also advised that the project's currently in procurement and the county is reviewing bids now. Um, council staff is recommending approval as submitted for this project. Mr. Dice, did you want to try to convince us not to do this? Go ahead, please. <laughs> no, I'm begging you to do it. It's, <laughs> this project's been on the books for over 17 years. It's uh, high, yeah, it's high time. Uh, and 
And we are really against it because the the landlord is not going to renew the lease uh, mm -hmm. where they are. So we have to get out, and uh, everyone's aware of that, which is why we've gone to bid. Bids are under review. Negotiations have not yet taken place, but will. Very and shortly. you feel like we can meet this time, time frame? Oh, the time frame, yes. I've, I've already got a list of people I'll fire if uh, that doesn't happen. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, is any of them sitting next to you? I mean, One I'm just checking. Uh, <laughs> you know. But, but uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be tough. Uh, the, the, you just had a discussion with uh, Fire and Rescue regarding apparatus. This is a problem. If, it, if it's a mechanical device of any sort, the backlog is incredible. Uh, we've gone rooftop units on, on other projects that were normally 16 weeks or 50 week lead times. This is uh, characteristic everywhere. So we have worked with the, uh, the contractor to make sure that some of these long lead items are uh, advanced purchase at their risk. Um, so uh, we have to do these things in order to move projects along, but uh, we're uh, ready to go as soon as we have the funding. Very good. Chief or Assistant Chief, do you have anything to add as well? So good morning. Good morning. Um, the, the only thing that I would add, uh, uh, Mr. President, is the fact that, you know, I've been here for 38 years. Um, the, first, uh, the first meeting I ever went to as a new deputy director of the 6th District Station in 2004 was the building of the new 6th District Station. And here I am in 2023 and there's not a shovel in the ground yet. So I think you get where, where I'm at. I've never known a project that took us this long to, uh, to, to get moving. So. Well, we're very fortunate that it's on fast track for the county. And we say thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. so. Any, anything else to add? Any from my colleagues? I have a feeling we're going to be 3-0 on this one. Yeah. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can get this one resolved faster than it's been resolved. And then, um, Susan, we're going to go to uh, number two. So you're clear that it was a 3-0 vote, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and for the second one is the uh, uh, Public Safety Communication Center phase two, electrical distribution and HVAC uh, upgrades. Did you want to lead us through that package? Sure. The Public Safety Communication Center is also known as the Emergency Communication Center, where they take 911 calls and non-emergency police calls. Uh, they've been in lease space for a long time. The county purchased this building several years ago, and that part of the project provided for replacement of mission-critical HVAC systems. This is the second phase. The remaining building HVAC systems are either original to the building or 17 years old, and there's a list of the current project overview, what is going to be replaced, including the generator plant, redundant electrical distribution upgrade, condenser water distribution, rooftop units, and HVAC system heat pumps. Um, this is currently in the design phase, and construction is slated to begin this summer since portions of the generator plant replacement and the redundant electrical distribution upgrade support 911 operations. They are eligible. They have some eligible expenses to be charged to the State Emergency Number Systems Board Trust Fund. Uh, the other systems are not eligible. This supplemental appropriation increases project costs by almost $5 million. The executive's advising that this increase is needed due to cost increases, again, related to supply, supply chain challenges and equipment costs, and again, is required to award the contract for construction. Council staff recommends approval as submitted. Thank you. Mr. Dice? Yeah, this is uh, uh, not all council members will know the history. This is... Uh, was an existing structure. Normally we like to build with the form following the function. This was an existing building the county purchased and we've been trying to make it work for its purposes. Uh, it's been an ongoing effort on, on our part to uh, make it operational. We're really pleased that this first phase being done, second phase undertaking, is going to finally make this a building that will operate efficiently and effectively for the critical services running out of it. So. Uh, this is really necessary. Again, third time's the charm, same discussion, long lead times on materials. Uh, contractors are waiting and ready to go as soon as we have the funds. Very good. Chief, did you have anything to add on that? No. Thank you very much. Any questions on this one? Are we okay for a 3 0 on that as well? <laughs> I'll try to be as very clear as I can, Ms. Brooke. Yes, thank you all very, very much for all that you do. I have a feeling that the next topic is going to be a little longer than the others. So just call me way out there. Um, 
and whoever's joining us for this one, please come on down. And um, there's no vote on this one. This is a, a briefing on the uh, police department staffing, including the Emergency Communication Center. And Ms. Frog, if you could lead us through that, please. Good morning. I'm just going to provide a bit of an overview of the situation and then ask the department just to go through a couple of things like their recruitment efforts and also some, some challenges that they're having as far as operational uh, to specifically highlight the Emergency Communications Center because they are significantly short-staffed and that is impacting operations. It does not necessarily mean that that is eroding the types of services given to the community, but it definitely is impacting operations. So it would be helpful to the committee to better understand that situation. But in terms of police staffing in general, um, police function a little bit differently than corrections or fire that have to have, you know, quote, butts in seats or mandatory posts that are filled in order to make trucks run or ensure uh, security for residents and correctional staff alike. Police have a little more flexibility if somebody's, you know, off and they, you know fellow officers can cover a beat but if it gets significantly short staffed and they have to start pulling on voluntary overtime and then mandatory overtime um, things start to get more challenging and it's not just patrol it's also detectives other investigators who are solving crime to make the community safer for everyone um, and to bring justice to those who have been victimized in our community we also have increasing dynamic emergencies that require a lot of flexibility like SWAT and emergency response team, special events response teams. Uh, we've had some significant events in the uh, county like the Discovery Center hostage situation in 2010. Um, you had the Magruder shooting in 2022. You've also had things like the planned large protest at the late term abortion clinic in Germantown back in 2012. But there have also been domestic violence incidents that have impacted the broader community. We had one that was a federal law enforcement officer who shot and killed his wife in Prince George's County, but he also shot somebody at Montgomery Mall and somebody at Aspen Hill. And he was later taken into custody here in Montgomery County. Uh, we had the Brookville hostage situation where neighbors were killed by the person, which started as a domestic violence incident. Um, and then we'd also had one in 2012 where an individual killed somebody in Kensington and there was a manhunt for this person who was later found in Rockville. So this takes a lot of services to be flexible and dynamic. And that is what's front facing toward the community. What the community does not necessarily see though is the training that's necessary to ensure that this specialized expertise exists and that training has to be appropriate. It has to be um, effective and it has to be consistent and ongoing to ensure that they're ready for any of these emerging situations that are happening in our community. So I'm turning it over to the department to talk about both sworn staffing and the impacts on operations as well as civilian staffing most particularly up in the emergency communications center and I've got information outlined dealing with attrition and recruitment and retention and there's also a salary co comparison chart on pages four and five if that's something that the Committee is interested in addition um, to some vacancy rate information on pages six and seven. Well, first up, before I begin, thank or as we begin, thank you very much for a very thorough packet and and all the information that you truly are an expert on, uh, Chief. And welcome again. If if the panel could please introduce themselves so yeah. the public is aware who's, who's Absolutely. here. Absolutely. So, Chief Marcus Jones, Chief of Police, Montgomery County Police. Darren Frank, Assistant Chief of uh, Management Services Bureau for Montgomery County Police. I'm Captain Michael Pratt, and as of three weeks ago, I'm newly promoted Director of our Personnel Division. Congratulations. Thank you. Cassandra Onley, Director of 911. You're not one. You're, there you go. Thank you. Uh, Derek, good morning, Derek Harrigan, Office of Management and Budget. And I did want to thank you all for being here and everything that you do. I did want to point out that we do have the uh, Lee Holland, who's the president of the Fraternal Order of Police, number 35, in the audience. And we have Dr. Earl Stoddard, who's representing uh, this, the uh, county executive, in the audience as well. So, um, And with that, Chief, please. So again, good morning um, um, to the Public Safety Committee. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be before you this morning. Um, I do want to um, begin with just some basics um, as to how do we address many of the community concerns when um, everywhere I go uh, throughout the county, this is the number one uh, topic. 
um, by many members of the community is about our staffing levels. Um, I will say this from a um, from a, as a chief of police and um, just uh, currently just recently I was with um, our major city chiefs association which our department is a member of the uh, one of the 79 largest police departments in the in the country um, and many of my um, if not all of them all of my fellow chiefs are suffering with this same issue um, and there we are um, we have been networking and really dialoguing on best strategies in order to um, enhance um, our membership roles on our departments, um, particularly as it relates to our sworn police officers. Um, and, you know, this has been, um, during my three-year tenure, this has been one of our largest challenges, um, is hiring. Um, and not only hiring, but retaining um, our members. Um, I have made it known that we have a large percentage of our department, um, larger than normal in past history. And I want to give a little context to that. Um, when we talk about the large percentage of our officers that are eligible for retirement. And if we can go back to really about the mid 90s, um, during the uh, President uh, Clinton, um, um, during his administration, um, there was a heavy emphasis on hiring police officers um, in the United States uh, through COPS grants. Um, and during, those period, during that period in the early 90s, Montgomery County Police had a heavy uh, um, latent, I would, well, I'd just say it was just a heavy uh, populated um, amount of officers who were veterans who were 25 years of service or more. Um, and at that point in time, the county made a decision to provide early retirement uh, offers to many of those officers. And those officers really created a mass exodus, um, at which point in time we had to hire um, in order to replace those officers at a very aggressive rate. Um, and back in those days, there were literally classes of 80 um, at one time for our police recruit classes, um, almost unprecedented at any time we've ever reached those numbers um, around the mid 90s. Well, here we are now 2023 and I'm here to tell you that those individuals who were hired during that time, it is now their time to retire. And so this is why we have a high percentage of our officers who are eligible to retire and those who came shortly thereafter, those particular officers. And so as I speak to community groups about, again, about their concerns about our lower levels of staffing, um, and again, it's a major concern of mine that's often that I speak with our, I get updates on a weekly basis um, during our uh, crime stat meetings uh, to talk about and with my assistant chiefs to talk about uh, specifics as it relates to not only our staffing levels with our sworn officers, but also our staffing levels with our professional staff, also known as our civilians, um, to include our emergency communication center. Um, and we have those discussions in order to create strategies and to maintain our strategies of providing the best service that we can provide to this community with what we have. Um, and again, it, it, this is again unprecedented. We've never, I would not say we've never been there, but we've never been in such a state that we've had to really maintain and monitor and do things differently. We've had to change our sort of the way we operate when it comes to um, position vacancies that we have within the department. So as everyone knows, the backbone of our department is our patrol division. It is, the, it is those officers, the largest division, um, that um, we have approximately um, 700, 836 authorized positions in the Patrol Services Bureau. Um, out of that right now, currently, we have 722 of those positions that are filled. These are your first responders, these are the individuals who are answering the 911 and non-emergency calls and are on patrol 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The different, we have uh, three different shifts. Uh, we have a day work shift that works from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. We have an evening shift that works from 3 p.m. to 1 a.m. Then you have a midnight shift 
that works from 8.30 p.m. until 6.30 a.m. So there's a little bit of overlap with all of these shifts in order to transition officers who are now closing out their day to those officers who are beginning their, their shifts. Um, and as we look at each district station out of our six district stations, which is directed by a commander and deputy commanders, it is vitally important um, that they are monitoring their, um, their shift levels as we have really a level that states that we have minimum staffing that is, that is um, allotted to make sure that we have the amount of officers necessary to cover the beats in order to answer the calls for service on any given shift. And if we don't have that minimum staffing, then supervisors are then authorized to actually um, call in officers on overtime in order to fill those slots. And that is often done. Um, and there can be a variety of reasons why shifts don't meet minimum staffing. Um, part of it can be for the fact that you have officers who are out sick. You may have officers who are out training um, or out on some other personal leave. And so therefore, supervisors have to be very cognizant of monitoring their leave buffers on every single day. Um, and uh, as we look at our district stations, we know, as a matter of fact, that we know the amount of vacancies that we have at each of those district stations. And so the commanders then have to really work hard to make sure that they have the minimum staffing in order to actually to answer those calls for service. And we have been meeting those challenges, although it is a challenge indeed. And I also want to note that, you know, often it is said that, well, you know, when these, uh, um, when things, when we have such events as um, Ms. Farag has noted um, regarding these um, protests and um, other major events that will then require more police officers to actually uh, provide uh, safety measures to make sure that the community is safe, regardless of what it is, whether it's a big event such as a Magruder incident or whether it's a protest, and uh, you can name you know hundreds of types of events. It does require us to have additional staffing in order to meet that. And so therefore, there are times that we are actually and have utilized other police officers who work in other bureaus, such as the Investigative Services Bureau. There have been times then we have basically instructed our detectives to bring their uniforms to work, though they don't wear a uniform to work every day um, in their roles, but they have been instructed at times, depending upon the nature of the emergency or the situation, that they actually will bring their uniforms to work in order to supplement the patrol officers should there, there, there be that need. Um, and so, one of the things that I want to make sure that we focus upon is that we will never allow, never allow any one given district to be below minimum staffing um, if we have to bring in other members of other districts in order to support them uh, to run calls for service. We do that. That's an operational um, need that our supervisors are trained on, our executives are trained upon, that if there's something that's going on that's so big that takes up the, uh, the workload of those who are already working and there are no available officers for calls for service, we will bring officers in from adjoining districts in order to help support that. We will bring other units such as our decentralized community action teams, our SAT teams. We bring in our uh, traffic units if need be. Um, so we will utilize other resources and help to support um, any public safety need that we see as we deem necessary. And that's something that's very important here. Um, over the years, I will just share this briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Assistant uh, Chief Frank to talk about our recruiting um, um, challenges and where we currently are. But one of the things I want to stress to this committee is the fact that um, over the past year, um, as we noted that these, we were going to have these significant personnel challenges, that uh, I made a decision working with our assistant chiefs um, that we would change our, our, our so-called the way our work product, you may say, or our process 
for filling specialized position vacancies. What do I mean by that? Well, for any officer that goes through the academy, their first, um, their first, their first assignment is going to be within the Patrol Services Bureau. And over the years, there are many of those officers who then begin to train, um, go to trainings, who may do temporary assignments because they want to go to a specialized position, such as a detective. And I'll, I'll use a detective as an easy analogy. Um, so they do have to have some background in order to be able to compete. And that is a competitive position that is, that is, uh, that they, they may compete with other officers for in order to obtain that position. And again, um, we have detectives in our investigative services bureau and a variety of different assignments. But one of the things that we have traditionally done with this department is that when there was a position open in any of these specialized units, our other support units, we automatically fill those positions without hesitation. And generally, the bureau that suffered the most as a result of those positions when they were opened up due to retirement, um, opened up due to uh, someone who may go to another assignment, the bureau that suffered the most was the Patrol Services Bureau. And so when, so you replace, when a, an individual from the Patrol Services Bureau then would go to the specialized unit, there's no one to fill the position that was just created in the Patrol Services Bureau until the next academy class is then um, graduates and then they successfully complete the field training program. So therefore, the Patrol Services Bureau, to put it uh, quite frankly, they were bleeding um, significantly as we began to start losing officers. So therefore, I made the decision that we, there would not be an automatic um, fulfillment of those specialized positions that would have to be an exemption that would have to be provided by me um, and with discussions with the assistant chiefs on what was the, the need, what was the significant need of the fulfilling that position at this, at that, at this present time and over the past year. Um, and so in other words, we slowed down um, filling position vacancies in some positions that we didn't see as mission centric. And what would I say mission centric? Well, I take a unit like major, the Major Crimes Division, our homicide unit. Our homicide unit, of course, handles all homicides in the county, but they also handle all deaths investigations, short of the uh, uh, an automobile or pedestrian uh, vehicle or traffic uh, fatality. So therefore, that's mission-centric. That's We have to have the bodies in the seats due to the workload in that particular division. Um, and so there's also um, other divisions that we also look at certain positions where they are also mission-centric that we think that needs to be filled. But there are also some vacancies that we've created as a result of not being mission-centric. Um, and, uh, and the reason being is because we just don't have the bodies at this point in time. Um, and um, so again, we have worked very hard to make sure that we still stay on task, that we have the ability to provide the services to this community that they so um, that they so desire and have desire for many of the years but again by being over 120 plus officers down there are some there are some losses there there is some work that may not that we may have been doing in the past that is not necessarily being done the same way today uh, we have significantly changed a little bit of our our work process from a standpoint that we now take more reports um, via our telephone reporting unit than we've done in the past um, in order to free up our patrol officers so that they're not tied up going to calls and writing those initial reports. So those are some of the things we have done in order to change processes in order to adapt to uh, the level of service that we've provided. Of course, tech, we can talk more about technology in a little while as well, as how technology is now enhancing some of our work. But 
Um, these are some of the challenges, so I just wanted to share a baseline with the committee so that you would understand a little bit about what what we have been doing as it as it relates to staffing um, issues and uh, being able to again uh, continue to provide those services to our community um, every day, all day. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Chief Frank and uh, let him talk about our recruitment um, as well as our retention issues. Thank you, Chief. Please, Assistant Chief. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, so. I want to start by uh, expressing how condition, conditions on the grounds have changed. Uh, and, and we've talked about this before. Uh, back when I came on 26 years ago, there were anywhere from 2,500 to 4,000 people applying for a session for, for maybe, uh, in my class, we had 40-some uh, police positions. Uh, now. Uh, our most recent classes, we have anywhere between 300 and 400 people apply for a single session, and we have many openings. Uh, that We've seen it dwindle uh, a little bit through the years, but there has been a profound effect from COVID and from uh, the incidents uh, that have occurred across the country, not here, but with George Floyd uh, and, and other events that have turned uh, folks uh, away from the law enforcement profession right now. Uh, the So now what we're looking at, we are, if you would, turning over every stone we can. We are reviewing and have been reviewing for the last year and a half every process we have, every method we have. In addition, I will say, you know, while it's easy to point to uh, uh, COVID and George Floyd, we, we've found that our young workers have changed a bit. They look for a work-life balance, and they don't see that in shift work all the time. They don't see that in having to work holidays all the time. And fortunately enough, in this economy, there are other jobs to be had. Uh, so we need to work very hard to get them back into the fold, to get them, uh, number one, to get them applying. And number two, for the ones that apply, we need to be the most competitive we can be with them. I have talked before that, that we need to be recruiting for both our emergency communications folks and our police officers that we need to recruit like we're a Division I college football team and we need to go after the best and the brightest with whatever we can and really invest in them, anyone that applies, and also invest in our process to get uh, the best coming here. Uh, the uh, I'll speak first about some of our initiatives for our emergency communication center. Uh, I've worked with uh, Director Onley for the past year and a half on these issues. It is very challenging. I would say that they, they're faced with even more challenges because the opportunity in that smaller environment for promotion, that opportunity for a pension doesn't exist currently, the opportunity um, for doing something a little bit different uh, really is a struggle because of the environment that they're in. But they are in one of our most critical uh, tasks, roles. They get us rolling to where we need to be. They're the, the voice on the other end of the line that brings calm and brings help. Uh, so she's been working very hard. I mean, just this month, uh, we've attended two uh, career fairs, uh, both at a high school and, Mon and Montgomery, Montgomery College. Um, we've also attended our our uh, citizen police academies, both our Latino Academy um, and our uh, normal academy, uh, again, in an, in an effort to num not only educate but also to recruit. Right now we're scheduled for 18 different on-site career fairs. We're scheduled for three virtual career fairs. Uh, we're going to the Frederick, uh, Frederick Police Public Safety Expo, Maryland State Firemen's Association, and the uh, Tacoma Park Citizens Academy. The, uh, we're advertising all through the DMV uh, on unemployment websites, and we're also using Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor. So we have a far reach that we're getting the word out there that we need people, uh, and we're constantly looking at one of, uh, one of the projects that we're engaged in right now is we've hired a consultant to help us really get a laser focus on our advertising and be more modern. Five years ago, it was okay to put an ad on Indeed or uh, a Monster. Right now, we have to talk about things like geofencing places, talk about sending Google ads directly 
uh, directly to the uh, fertile grounds that we, we would expect to find uh, candidates. We've all, and when you talk about that, we've done a, uh, Director Onley's done a very good job at reaching out to our public high schools. Uh, coming out of high school, this is a tremendous opportunity to have a, a job in serving their community. And we see a, a possibility that we'll find more candidates there to get them started in the law, law enforcement profession. Um, and, and they've done a terrific job liaisoning there and getting in, getting in front of those students. Uh, to, and also Montgomery College. The, um, we are working on developing and implementing a, a formal uh, ECC recruitment team. I'll talk about um, what we do on the police side. Um, the, we're also, uh, and it will be similar to that, essentially finding internal folks that can uh, talk about the benefits of being uh, one of our emergency communication specialists be able to go out there and talk about the benefits and, the, and the, how rewarding the job is. Uh, so we're working on that. We're working on revi revitalized uh, website. We have found over the last uh, year and a half that our website doesn't attract like we want it to. Uh, we can do better there and that's one of the things that we've hired the consultant for and we've also got some internal work going on there. We're also working with the Maryland 911 board um, and the Council of Government on uh, recruitment issues as well. The, I will say, and again, I, I, I kind of referenced it a little bit, we don't advertise on monster.com anymore, we don't advertise on military.com because we're evaluating everything we do and we're just not getting a return on investment there. Uh, so it, right now we keep having classes of two and three people that's not getting the job done. Unfortunately what we have is you know, these, these folks, they're coming in, they're doing the job, but they're also seeing an opportunity in other parts of county government uh, for a job that doesn't have the shift work, that has a more, uh, a, a better work-life balance, that has a better schedule, and we're losing people to that all the time. So we're, we're going to continue to work on that. I know we're, uh, we've been working with the second floor. Uh, right now it's full-term bargaining for a number of the unions, uh, and we keep working on ideas to make things better. Director Onley is continually coming up with ideas to make things better uh, in addition to just pay, uh, re uh, retirement, and other issues we may have. Uh, moving on to the police, uh, I've been working, so as Captain Pratt said, he's had three weeks, three so whole he weeks. He pretty much has solved everything since he, he's gone well, here, right? He's, he's, certainly, he's, he's certainly picked up the ball from Commander Smith, who was doing a fantastic yeah, job. We knew, we knew um, Commander. Although he, he's, he's trying to tell me different for his rating or something. I don't know. It's <laughs> weird. Um, but we uh, have been going at this now again uh, for a long time, looking at every aspect of our process. One of the first things we did was engage the innovation team uh, with Montgomery County. Uh, government and and they came in and uh, were a, a, a uh, almost an outside set of eyes looking at our process, looking at how we did things, and identified a number of weaknesses. Uh, in my conversations with Captain Smith and with Captain Pratt, we, we keep having issues come up, and we go to search for root causes. And when we go to search for those root causes, we're like, oh, there's something we need to fix. So there's been many things along the way that, that have presented themselves. And, and really what we have found is uh, a number of our policies, a number of our methods were based on those days when I got hired, when there were 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 people applying. Uh, and we needed to whittle uh, down the selections to uh, just be able to get through a reasonable size because we didn't have the ability to go through 4,000 people. Uh, so we continue to work on those, and let me be clear when I uh, let me be clear on this: we are not lowering our standards. We are not lowering the standards to become a Montgomery County police officer. We are looking at different things that we have found um, that have caused disparate impact. I've talked about this before. We found that we um, moved our test score up to 70 percent, uh, and we found that uh, we created a disparate impact on uh, minority groups and. We don't have a reason why, because that's going to take some study, uh, because it's the same test that we've given for a long time. But in recognizing that, we can't exclude people on an unknown. Uh, so we we changed what our we changed what our threshold was. 
um, to what it was before. Again, we raised it and then saw that impact. So we continually uh, evaluate what we're doing and, and tweak what we're doing so that we have a larger group of candidates to pick from, uh, a larger group of candidates that make it through our processes. It's a difficult process. We lose a lot of candidates, uh, so we have a number that show up for the test. Actually, I should say a number that say they're going to show up for the test, and then we have less that show up for the test. And then when they take the test, when they pass, which we get good grades on that, when they pass and they get the background investigation, people self-select out. Uh, and then in addition to that, the people that get to the background and start submitting that, we're in competition with many other departments for them. Uh, departments that have uh, different opportunities with them, whether that be location, whether that be pay, whether that be pension, whether that be bonuses. So we're in competition, again, like a Division I school with all kinds of, all kinds of different uh, good programs. Uh, and we're trying to latch into these folks and get them on board. Some of the things that we are doing uh, in that realm, the uh, visiting all kinds of fairs, whether it's Montgomery College we, or, or any college on the East Coast. Uh, I just heard one of our recruiters was down in Georgia. Uh, trying to trying to drum up some business down there, but uh, we had 135 visits last year uh, to different universities, uh, and that includes historically black colleges. Uh, we have military visits. We go to uh, uh, all of uh, we go to the local bases as well as the Citadel. We go to Camp Lejeune. Uh, we have advertising on every every form that we have found value in. We used to have billboards going down to Ocean City. We don't have those anymore. We weren't getting an ROI there. Um, but we are fine-tuning that. Again, I mentioned uh, the effort with the uh, outside, con outside uh, consultant that is helping us laser point our uh, recruiting efforts, so we're working on different things. Uh, we were aware, we became aware, and I think everyone saw it, Community Today caused a little bit of an uproar that I think it was Prince George's County that was over recruiting at our Community Day. Um, we're doing things like that as well. We might be a little bit more stealthy with Google, uh, but we know there's people that want to come and work in Montgomery County, and we're doing what we can to find them. Uh, we are uh, doing pop-up events at Montgomery Mall at Veterans Plaza. We're doing uh, community days at community events, anytime that we can spread the word. I will say one of the best recruitment options that have existed over time has been the people that work here. And when they talk about the organization and the benefits of, of being here, that becomes a very, very solid uh, way to get people involved. Um, we are, uh, we've done some uh, public safety training academy open houses and we'll continue to do those and uh, we're also doing uh, some poster campaigns. The internal recruiting, we've increased our uh, uh, decentralized recruiters. These are officers that uh, when uh, will go out to these pop-up events or will volunteer to go to one of these universities. Uh, we now have over 50 trained uh, decentralized recruiters. We have a mentoring program uh, for uh, new recruits, new hires before they come on board. We have the Police Explorer Program and the Cadet Program, which is Council Salt the Wisdom, along with Chief Jones and Expanding. Uh, we have a pre-hire program. We have a, a, a fantastic uh, pre-hire program. Well, first, one of the things, we, when, when folks are available to work, we want to get them in as soon as we can. So we hire them and we put them to work at jobs where they can support the law enforcement mission, gain a little bit of experience before they start the academy. But we also have a program where they come and they work out, where they come and they're mentored, where they get in shape for the academy. We've just added new components to that to include driving and shooting uh, because we don't want to have those failures in the academy. You know, one of the, it, it's, it, seems, it seems odd to say that we have people fail driving, but the reality is these young folks, uh, some of them have never driven before. They've taken, uh, mom and dad have driven them, they've taken public transportation or they Ubered. They just haven't driven a car, not a, let alone a big car uh, with a big engine in it. So we're, we're working on, on uh, doing things like that to, once we get them in the door, they stay through the academy because we do still lose a number through the academy through academic failures or task failures. Um, we, uh, 
uh, we're looking at changing our online application program uh, to a different vendor. What we have found is that the county system is cumbersome and turns people off. They want it to be intuitive like Apple. Um, so we are working on a new system there and we're going to have to bridge the gap there and we've, we've gotten a lot of uh, great support through the county with that. Uh, we continue to collaborate with the local universities and again, I, it's uh, again through another effort uh, through the county with uh, Montgomery College, uh, with the uh, council uh, directing some, uh, making some important direction. We've got a very robust relationship there. Um, but uh, we, 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 still have, we still have challenges. We're trying to get people in. The, we're looking for new opportunities. I will tell you that, uh, and I believe uh, President Holland referenced a pilot program for hiring bonuses in his letter to you. Uh, the department uh, has put that forward as one of the pieces to assist in what we're doing. Um, the, uh, in preparation for today, I was looking for anything I could on, on uh, in scholarly articles about the effectiveness of uh, hiring bonuses. Uh, the information is very limited because no one's really studied it because again this is a this is a new change for this profession. However I will say there is scholarly uh, information that hiring bonuses work for the military. Um, they, they are effective. They're not the end-all be-all uh, but they are effective and we also see results uh, in our own backyard that it is a, that it has potential. Uh, Anne Arundel County has just advised us that for the first time they have over hired a class uh, in a little bit of time and they were one of the leaders one of the leaders in this with a twenty thousand uh, dollar hiring bonus. So it, and, and again that's not the end-all be-all we're still looking for every single thing we can do to change this narrative uh, and and happily, I will say, we have seen a slight turn. Not in the numbers, but we've seen people that have come to us and said, you know, I'm a Montgomery County resident, I want to be a Montgomery, police, Montgomery County police officer. And they're only applying to us. Uh, so we're latching onto them as best we can. Now we've got to compete with the ones that are looking all through the DMV, uh, or even further than that, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, see where we can get those folks down here and get them, uh, get them in our doors so we can make them part of our Montgomery County family. Thank you very much. Um, before I continue, we've been joined by Mr. Dale Phillips, who is the new police uh, budget director, I understand. Welcome. And as, as we begin this, I did want to mention uh, publicly that we, and we're going to get into much of what you've already discussed, but um, we did receive, we being the council, did receive a a concern from some from a person who couldn't get through 911 because uh, uh, because of a, of a mental health issue and they kept getting a message that said do not hang up. Uh, several neighbors also tried to call but they couldn't get through. Uh, the person in crisis began threatening people, sheltering in place in a house. There was concern about the uh, imminent arrival of a school bus. I don't know how familiar you are with that. I don't like to, but if someone could please look into that and get back to us as quickly as possible as to how we can avoid that and never have that in the future, please. Yes, sir. And and if uh, as soon as we get the information, Director Onley and I uh, look at those on a routine basis. I will tell you, we have identified an issue with our, well, it's a human issue. Uh, with other people on the end of the line. I'm not saying that's the case in this this particular instance. But we do have a holding time on the phones uh, and Director Onley can give you precise numbers. But what we are seeing is even though we say don't hang up, people in crisis hang up and think they're going to call again and go to the front. Um, we've had a couple times that we've investigated because people have called in because it is a great concern of ours and we're able to track down uh, when they called in and what was occurring at the time. We had an incident not too long ago where uh, we had someone call again and again and again trying to get through and we basically had a, a uh, perfect storm at that time. There was a major accident on 270 and one of the challenges, so one of the challenges that we run into and that we continue to run into and we're trying to wrap our heads around is everyone has a phone now. So everyone sees something and everyone calls 911. And calling 911 for everything you see is not 
necessarily the best thing because the 911 needs to stay open for those critical events where, where folks need to uh, take the call right away. And again, honestly, staffing issues, those, those will come into play. Uh, we are within, we are within uh, norms for uh, call times, but this, this problem we're having with the uh, recordings, we continue to fine tune and, and try and figure out a way that, to make people please, please don't hang up. I'm not saying that's the instance here, and we'll, we'll, we'll thoroughly look at it uh, and, and come up with information on those. But Director Onley and I have uh, looked at those a number of times, and it, it comes back to that issue right there. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Director? Yeah. But thank you. And, um, and I did want to point out, as we go through the report, or is, on page two, uh, Ms. Frog has, has mentioned the, the staffing numbers that we have uh, in, over the years and authorized sworn officers. But that does not include Rockville, Gaithersburg, and, and, uh, and Chevy Chase Village. So if we could, I understand that's not, but if we're looking at numbers, I think we probably should have a parenthesis somewhere that says in addition to. Yes, I can absolutely check with the local municipalities to find out what their current staffing numbers are. I know that Rockville has had some issues recently yes. and they collapsed a midnight post or shift and are going to 12 hour shifts. Um, they are not full service police departments, only Tacoma Park is, so MCPD still su provides support in a lot of their public safety services. Well, when you're saying they're not full service, they're not full service, they are on 24-7, it's not, it, I, I don't want to give the public the impression, that, yes, they don't have the uh, detective bureau right, exactly. and those types of right. types of issues. But there again, they are someone who's on the street, as the, as the chief has, has mentioned earlier. So I think it would be helpful, and I'll you can, that for you, you. and in the parentheses you can put all the other qualifiers. Okay. But I do think it'd be necessary to let us know. Um, you know, in general, uh, and, and we're having problems. We are being the county. The county's having problems getting employees in general for for bus drivers. I see the new director shaking his head. Uh, in for bus drivers and fill in every other every other issue. And, and it is true that, that this is a nationwide problem. It is true that, you know, that we're not the only ones in this situation. And we're not going to solve it nationwide, but we have to figure out how to solve it here. And, and we need to be able to do it as quickly and as properly as we possibly can. Um, we need to figure out the right formula. And I understand, and uh, uh, President Holland is here, I understand much of this is collective bargaining, and we're not in any way attempting to, to, to you know, to, to get in the middle of that. I mean, that's not what we're here for. We want to figure out working with our partners, whether it be the unions, whether it be with you all, whoever it is, what is the right formula for us, money-wise, whatever it is, to to get people that want to be here. And and once somebody says, yeah, I'd like to be here, we need to make certain that they're hired. We can't say, and we'll get back to you in six weeks. Here's somebody that needs needs money or needs a job, and and they're going to go to the to the next spot down the down the road. And and I also have to tell you that I've had people. Uh, um, it, it, you, you know, we talk about you know been here 26 years, but but I've had people say, you know, air, air retirement is is good. I mean, you know, in comparison. But if you have a new hire, if you have somebody who's just coming out of college and who just had a, a, a baby, they're not as concerned about their retirement. They will be and should be eventually, but that week they're not. They want to know what their paycheck's going to be in two weeks. And, and we have to keep that in mind. And we need to make sure, and, and I know that, and well, I don't know, I, I know from the letter that, that uh, the FOP sent that there has been uh, some additional uh, bargaining for for bonuses and whatnot. I mean, we haven't been told directly, but but um, I don't know what the right number is for that. And and if we also have to keep in mind that if we're given bonuses for someone to go to to be here, what are we doing for the officer that and 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 personnel that are here? I mean, well, how are we? How are we saying if you somebody can get twenty thousand can retire and that thirty percent can retire and go to Anne Arundel County and 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 I'm 
glad that they didn't. But if they decide to stay here, then then um, what are we doing then? I mean, how do we keep them? And and I don't know how bonuses work. And I I guess that's another question. Do you, I would assume that they don't give them a check for twenty thousand dollars the first day. So how does how do those bonuses work? So I can answer that generally. The we, no, we wouldn't want to give them on the first day because we do see some attrition on the yeah, first day, or, or the second and, day either. And, and actually, and actually, because of uh, because of the contractual process, if we gave it to them on the first day, it would be part of their part of their pay package, and that's negotiable. So uh, the only other thing to do would be to give it to them before they get here, which would not work out well. Uh, the uh, you have to negotiate. Uh, I know that uh, uh, we've had discussions with Lodge 35 and we appreciate their receptiveness on the issue. Uh, and, and again, as alluded, you, the council will be seeing something. But in general, you would attach, you would attach uh, uh, what we've seen our partner agencies do is attach uh, certain percentages of that bonus to a threshold. Graduation of the academy, uh, graduation of the field training program, uh, one year on, two year on, three year on. So you would, come up with some framework like that so that uh, it keeps people plugged in as opposed to just a uh, giveaway uh, that, that, that people could uh, really take advantage of. Well, and I appreciate that. And I think we need to figure out what the right number is to, in all parts of what I just said. The, the other thing is, and of course we, we were actually, I, I can use the word embarrassed that our starting salaries were as low as they were. I mean, it was, uh, you know, for so long we were, you know, it was a sense of pride and, 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 uh, and then all of a sudden we were at the bottom or near the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, area. And we've since moved up. We need to figure out what the right number is for that. And there again, just because we can attract someone, just because we can sell them the car, we have to be able to service it as well. We have to be able to make certain that that person is staying here and, and for all the right reasons. We are, everyone, every one of us uh, uh, wants to make certain that we have the very best, uh, diverse, qualified people to be on Air Force. And, and uh, and we have a very fine force, and I, I say that on a continual basis. I, I sincerely thank people for saving our lives every day. I go to the, the, uh, the award ceremonies, and, and the, what, what a police officer does um, is just remarkable on how many lives they save and how someone got themselves in that situation that that police officer had to save them. And it's just unbelievable and, and we probably need to to have uh, uh, the, the air cable TV film that so that others are aware of what, what people go through. I, I'm going to stop. I know that my, my colleagues have other things to add but but let me just say that that we need to continue to make certain and, 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 and uh, Assistant Chief Frank, you mentioned this, that, that we can't recruit necessarily the same way we did recruit. We don't have the legacies. There, you, you know them as well as I do. There's f families that used to say, you know, this is a good job and you should, you should be in that. You know, you should do this job. Your, 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 your mother did it, your, your father did it, and, and in some cases grandparents. They're saying, you know, today you can make a different living, a better living. It's not as hard. So, you know, think of something else. We need to get that person back. We need to make, get, get the, the, the frame of mind back that we are appreciative of Air Police Force and all of our first responders, not just to pick on Air, on, not just to mention Air Police Force, and, and to thank them for it. So with that, I'm going to turn to whoever would like to, to my, to my right. First time ever anybody ever turned to their right in Montgomery County, but I'm going to turn to my right. And, and, uh, and I don't know what to say about that. Yeah, I hear you. I All right. That to Mark Elbert. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to ask a few questions that I jotted down um, related to the testing, right? So, you know, and I know I've had to write those little tests myself for some of my own classes for law enforcement. Are you utilizing all multiple choice tests? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Um, and I know, you know, there's obviously a benefit to that in that it's easier to score, easier to grade, faster to, to process. However, it is also um, more challenging in that not everybody takes multiple choice tests very well. So um, one of the things that I had found, particularly in teaching about hate bias and hate crimes, was that giving a multiple choice test on that particular content became challenging. And so then I'd have to do remediation with an officer who didn't score high enough on the test. But they could talk to me about the content. They knew the content, and they knew the nuance to it, too. Right, and that's incredibly important because a lot of what is done in law enforcement work is actually quite nuanced and not always, you know, we'd love to live in a totally black and white world where it's yes, no, true, false, but not everything is. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way that, you know, because I don't believe that the Police Standards Training Commission requires that it be multiple choice. It's just typically how it's done. Is there something we can do to be more flexible in that so that we're truly assessing knowledge in a better way? The answer is yes. And let me be honest with you. I took the test that we are giving. First of all, it's a, a standardized test that we give because we need to be defensible in our actions uh, through our hiring processes. Uh, so the I took the test. I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like it for a number of reasons, and I gave Captain, uh, Captain Smith at the time, but actually it's now Captain Pratt's uh, responsibility uh, to look at our next round of testing and see what we can uh, what we can do to, to make a test that really gets to the core of what we want and that mm -hmm. also has to do with our changing perspective of what we want again this test has been around for more than a decade and it was looking to siphon out people uh, uh, based on, do you already know something about how to generally be a police officer? Some of the questions were recall things you saw a wanted poster and, and tell me what you see. Some of the questions on it were honestly psychological. Uh, and uh, that, another reason I didn't like it because we already have a psychological mm -hmm. process that goes along with it. What we want to get to is a test that is defensible, number one, but number two looks at character, uh, looks at ethics, uh, looks at those values that we want because we firmly believe that we can we can train people we have an outstanding academy we can teach people how to be a police officer I don't need you to know how to do those things coming in I need you to have a little bit of common sense um, but really what I need is a strong ethical core that's what we all need uh, and, and our instructors through the different relationships we have can can do the police part so uh, we are looking at that we are looking to change it uh, and, um, and, and also another thing, we have a questionnaire that we give that uh, uh, Captain Pratt and I just worked on. Again, it's been the same questionnaire for a long time. And we both read the questions and neither of us liked them. Uh, and it's interesting how these issues come up and they get in front of us. Uh, and uh, even though we're, we've been doing a complete teardown, it's little things like that that people didn't think, well, that's not a big deal. Uh, it, it was, it is a big deal, and we want to find something that better fits these these new these new folks that we're hiring this next generation. So both of those areas we are working on, uh, and and I agree that uh, multiple choice isn't the best option. It's just finding, again, finding something that we can build that's defensible. Yep. Having having taken three states bar exams, and there's always a multiple choice day. That's the multi-state. Everybody's got to take that. I didn't like it either. Um, and then there's always an essay day, right? Um, and they, they allow you to show two different skill sets or two different abilities. And um, often, again, when you're talking about the law, there's a lot more gray than there is black and white on many things. Um, we, you were talking about um, the potential bonus issue and the recruitment issues and something I heard former Chief Morris, who's now the Chief of Staff to Anne Arundel County PD, talking about is, um, you know, the loss or the ability for our federal law enforcement partners to attract people. So, you know, they may have gone through an academy and gone through training and served for a while in a local law enforcement department, but you're, they're lose, you know, we're losing people to um, our federal law enforcement partners since we're all entangled here together in the DMV. Um, is that something that you have seen or experienced within our uh, officer corps? We've experienced it a little bit, but 
what we have found is there's a similar pattern that we've had uh, prior, to, prior to these issues. We have people that always want to kind of see is the grass greener. Uh, and that goes for other uh, local law enforcement agencies too. Like they'll see something, well, maybe I'll go down to South Carolina and be a police officer, or maybe I'll go down to Florida. So we have seen people leave for federal jobs, but we've seen a good number of them come back. We've seen people leave for other police agencies. We've seen a good number of them come back because they get there and the grass isn't greener. Mm -hmm. So we do have that. We, I, uh, uh, we haven't studied it in depth with, with uh, you know, interviews of these individuals after five years where they've gone on to a federal job to see if, you know, was this just something you always wanted to do? Because, you know, when I came on, uh, at one point I had, you know, delusions of grandeur. I wanted to be some FBI agent that I saw in a movie, right? Uh, and then I got here and found that, yeah, I didn't want to do that. Some people do keep with that track and want to go there. But uh, I will say the, the area that we have been losing to uh, federal law enforcement agency is people that are retirement ages. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a number that have reached retirement ages and taken advantage of the fact that there are a number of opportunities um, in, in different aspects of, of government law enforcement. Uh, maybe not that brand new FBI agent, but there are many things going on uh, in homeland security and right. issues there that we lose people to. But that's a loss on the end of the career uh, where they're retiring, they've already put in 25, generally put in 25 mm -hmm. or more years and moving on. And then with respect to the tiered out payment for the bonuses that you had discussed earlier, and uh, you know, again, you were talking about folks who aren't always thinking about the pension on the front end of their career, um, things like that, and the payout too, for tax purposes, it would be less impactful on the tax purpose for the individual receiving the funds if it was tiered out as well. They'd take um, a different uh, tax hit for that, so um, that's something that actually benefits the, the person receiving the bonus as well. Um, the work-life balance piece that you talked about, um, you know, sometimes, and, and particularly in very tiered, structured organizations, whether it's military or law enforcement, et cetera, um, it's not always easy for someone to feel like they can speak up or have their voice heard to make a change in a policy. Um, even as you noted the form, you know, you haven't looked at the form in a while. It's an old dusty form. And then you look at the form, you see it with new eyes, right? Sometimes um, making adaptations or changes that allow the workers to have that insight or input into help helping the organization as a whole lets them feel greater job satisfaction and more buy-in to the to the mission of the agency as a whole. So could you speak to some of the things that you're contemplating or that you've already done in that area that are allowing um, officers and uh, civilian employees to have that kind of input to help um, the organization as a whole? So we're, we're always looking for new ideas. I will tell you it's a complex structure because because of our uh, union agreements, we want to be careful that we don't trip over a line and, and, and be involved in something like direct dealing uh, on different issues. We have a lot of very good informal relationships where, where people bring up ideas. And I, I you know our executives, uh, we're very proud of them. Uh, they know they don't know everything, and they're looking for ways to improve. And it's having those executives uh, have relationships with uh, the union members, the people that are doing the work on the street, uh, to bring up ideas and discuss them um, in, in a manner, again, that's not against contract, but it, it percolates to the top. I can think of a number of things uh, through the year. I'll give an example for myself. We didn't have digital recording. Uh, in major crimes when I was a homicide detective, or actually when I started as a robbery detective. And my, uh, I worked with uh, my command staff to go and digitize all of our recording equipment. I got the full support of it. So there's ways to do there, and you have to have an executive group that wants to listen. And I will tell you, under Chief Jones's leadership, he's, he's let it be known, you know, we don't have all the ideas. The people that are out on the road have the ideas. The people that are in ECC have the ideas. Uh, Director Onley has uh, fostered an environment there, again, being careful not to trip over those union agreements, but foster an environment where people can bring up ideas, make recommendations, and they can be evaluated. Uh, most recently, she engaged in a, uh, a large committee to work on looking at the schedule for ECC and, and had a very had a terrific uh, 
uh, dynamic between all of the individuals at ECC to come up with a, a, a new uh, schedule for right now, and she's going to continue to look at that uh, as staffing allows to figure out the best work-life balance there. I will say with Lodge 35, I've talked with uh, Director Holland, uh, I'm sorry, President Holland, uh, a number of times. Uh, and uh, I'm more than welcome. Uh, I love hearing ideas from his end. He has uh, him and, and the rest of his team have provided ideas that we've looked at. Uh, I, again, because he referenced it uh, on the bonus issue, they had some ideas. Uh, we listened, and, and, and I think when, when uh, the details come out, uh, that uh, will show good collaboration there. So we're always open to collaborating with Lodge 35. And, and listening to the ideas again because they represent the people they represent the people that are out there every night doing the work every day during do, doing the work and there's brilliant ideas out there to be had and uh, the last questions I have or comments are related specifically to the ECC and 911 so I don't know if I should do those now or later <laughs> we were gonna we were gonna get back to the ECC I don't okay. know did you why don't you hold that? Okay, I will hold those. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Council Member Meg, please. I also have ECC questions. <laughs> well, I guess oh. we're going to get to the ECC here. Okay. Well. <laughs> so, Ms. Frog, if you could, could you lead us through that, you know, the discussion on that, for what, any anything from the packet, and then we'll turn to our air questions. Right. Um, just briefly, the... Uh, ECC is down in staff. It's mostly civilian staff, and there's been this 10-year-long consolidation process to unify call taking and dispatch and civilianize everybody there. Um, the goal there was to to shift career firefighters, which you know that we have a shortage of on the career firefighter side, to back to the floor so that they could respond to fires and EMS events. Um, there were additional positions added in the budget last year that were approved to increase civilian staffing so that several firefighters could be shifted over because of the staffing shortages and their recruitment challenges. They have not been able to fill those positions either. Um, they have um, had some operational impacts such as combining two talk groups at a time on the police side um, and they've also had to have some supervisors fill in for call taking or dispatch and that erodes supervisory um, supervision at the at the at the ECC. Uh, additionally, it's an extremely stressful job. They do not know the resolution of the very often frantic calls that come in where they hear very tragic information and they don't know what the resolution to those calls are. The police would know. Um, they, you approved in the budget, I believe FY21, for a licensed clinical social worker who is embedded at the ECC to help with the mental health and wellness of staff at that location. Um, there had been some discussion about increasing 911 fees in order to get um, help try to fund a better retirement or a real pension. Um, there was a law passed last year or the year before that wanted public safety telecommunicators to be treated like other public safety first responders to show that these are very um, in incredibly important positions and they play a really important role in the entire delivery of public safety services. And so compensation should be um, according to that importance as well as things like pensions because first responders are some of the last individuals who have real pensions right now. So um, if, if Ms. Only could um, talk a little bit more about the challenges, what they're trying to do to help recruit and whether or not they're applying for this 911 fee increase and what the results of that may be. Thank you. Please. Good morning. Good morning. So let me paint a picture. I was hired in 1991, okay, and I started as a call taker dispatcher under the police department. Back then, it was different. Whenever you called 911, if you needed the police, it stayed with us. And then if you needed an ambulance or fire truck, we would transfer that call to sworn firefighters. So we were able to then consolidate moving in that direction. So starting in 2016 and finally uh, having all calls answered by staff, it's not just police non-emergency, it's all non-emergency calls, whether it's fire, police, and all 911 calls. So all of those calls are taken by my staff. So with that, then either a call for service is sent for police or fire 
uh, dispatch or it's redirected to some other resource, whether it be the crisis center, animal control, or some other entity within the county if they're able to help. But typically people call us first because we don't close, we're always there. So that's where that education piece needs to come back into the public on what is the appropriate time to call 911, let alone the non-emergency number, because that's where we are getting inundated with calls that shouldn't even be coming in. And with recent legislation that was passed by Senate uh, with, we have to report how many calls are really emergency calls that come into the 911 center. And it's really taxing and I understand, you know, people, if you have an emergency and especially the medical emergencies, we need to get to those right away. So what we're doing, it's not just hiring, it's really the retention of the people. Um, because they are facing burnout, you know, it's call after call after call or dispatch, dispatch after dispatch. And that's, that's what we hired them for and that's what we're doing. However, it's the constantness of it. So as um, Assistant Chief Frank said, what we're already doing, um, going to different career fairs, whether it be to high schools, whether it be to universities, whether it be to community colleges, we also want to um, initiate a Zoom with a dispatcher or a 911 specialist. We want to do that monthly. Uh, so people understand what that job is about. Hollywood does a good job of uh, uh, putting out their, their perception of what it is but we don't solve crimes, we don't, you know, we, we handle the call. So there is some difference in, in reality versus perception. So we are working on that with the um, implementing a firm, formal ECC recruitment team. You know, it was already said, the folks that do the job have some of the best ideas and it's how we can implement those ideas and really get the staff out there. So the recruitment team is really coming to fruition. They've already been out there recruiting, but we want something more formal um, so we can have people engaged to do that. The mandatory overtime is also crushing uh, my staff. And, you know, it's that work-life balance we talked about right and that's where it is important right now we have a 12-hour shift and then we integrated some 10-hour shift that was part of that work schedule because as a parent or as somebody who's taking care of a parent or a loved one we got to be able to make sure we balance that and it's very important that people know at the end of the day am I going to go home or am I going to be held another four hours and sometimes they get it because emergencies do come up However, it's the constantness of it. It's every day that they work, yeah, should they be subjected. And that's where the mental well-being mm -hmm. of our staff, and we talk about mental well-being, the mental health of everyone in the public, but the public, we are the public, right? We're employees, so it does carry over to us. So it also uh, affects morale. And what I mean by morale is because we are still housed with our Montgomery County Fire Rescue Partners. Um, when they are in a uh, dispatch position and they're collecting a retirement and my staff is not, that is creating mm -hmm. a difference. Mm -hmm. And you know some of the benefits, and I understand, but we are public safety. It's not police, fire, it's the public in which we serve. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the visitors, residents, and or those in uniform. So um, that's how we are approaching it as the ECC team, that we are public safety regardless of who you are. Um, so what we are going to do also is put forward mm -hmm. to increase the 911 fees that should help with some of the funding that we need uh, so we can get better, um, hopefully a retirement for my folks, but also we are looking at retention bonuses and hiring bonuses, but um, I'll just pause on that issue. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Yeah, are you all represented by McGeo? Who are you? McGeo. McGeo. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the bargaining Correct. as well. Um, and I'm going to turn to uh, Councilmember Mink uh, in two seconds, but have you considered a, a, like a cadet program or an, in, uh, an intern program or 
yes and actually we were supposed to have an intern last year but they actually went someplace else so we are entertaining that and let's bring them back i know right right we are working with the high schools closely with that so i give it to um my administrative specialist he's phenomenal and we are working with the high schools to try to get interns and and if we could miss rog if we could figure out how much monies we're talking about for a true pension as you mentioned in your packet a true pension benefit how much it would actually cost in order to do that that's going to take some actuarial analysis that is way above my pay grade I, but i can reach not out to the executive do, staff to see if there's any um, ballpark numbers ballpark could, estimates if someone whoever who's whoever pay grade that's in I think that would be most helpful. And I agree with you. If someone sitting next to you is getting a true pension, then you should get one as well. So, and with that, I'm going to turn to Councilmember Mink. I agree. I think that's terrible. We need to remedy it. Um, I wanted to just, um, do, do we know how the professional staff retirement benefits in ECC in the crime lab compare to other jurisdictions in the region? So I will say out of the 24 public safety answering points in Maryland, it's only Montgomery County and one other jurisdiction for the 911 specialists that do not have a retirement. Well, that's telling. Thank you. But, but in, all, in other areas, some places don't have a police department, they have fire department, but they, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not always looking at right. apples to apples here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and that's not to say that they shouldn't have it. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, but it's in comparison. Did you want to say something sure. about that? No, okay. no, no. Okay. Um, and then also noting that um, it was mentioned that the, the lack of career advancement opportunities is also an issue there. Um, was, that, was that mentioned or is that? That was mentioned. However, we have done a, a better job with that by having, we have a specific quality assurance team, a training team, an IT team, SOP. So we do have different areas. So that has expanded in 2013. Um, so that is growing even more as, of course, as our staff continues to grow. Great, thank you. Um, so we heard in, in a good bit of detail about how shortages amongst the sworn officers are being handled in both the day-to-day -day, uh, and looking kind of uh, longer term, um, which positions to delay the filling of and, and so on. Um, is there anything else um, that would be good for us to know about how those shortages and those vacancies are being handled on the ECC side? So every day we have, just like the sworn side, we have minimums and we got to be cognizant of the budget. So we got to be careful of that. What we don't like to do is continually consolidate radios because it does affect public safety. Um, so we continue to look at, are there other creative ways that we could have people fill in? So sometimes I do have to pull some of my support staff to help answer, let alone the management side. But once you have the management helping, then that oversight of management, it, it dwindles. So it's a cause and effect there. Um, I guess it, it, it really is it, it is about money, but it's not about money. It is that work-life balance. It is the hours. And we're talking also about part-time work because we have some staff that have left, um, but they are interested in coming back mm -hmm. as part-time because their life has changed a little bit. Um, so that is one thing that I think that we can tackle that would help us in the interim. Can you explain when you said consolidate radios, what does that mean? So we have right now we have poli six police districts yeah. and we consolidate them down. We have two on one channel as opposed to having oh, six I see channels, what you're saying. then yeah. we'll go to three. Yeah. Okay. Um, the mandatory overtime, about how often would would a you know one particular worker um, experience uh, you know, getting tasked with mandatory overtime. Typically every day. It's mm -hmm. been every day. Wow. So, okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, with the pandemic, the hours, and we've been tracking, you know, since the beginning of time, but uh, with the pandemic, of course, and that's where we had to make sure we're, we were operating both of our facilities so we can do the separation because we can't be down. 
Um, our numbers have gone down for mandatory, but they're still, they're still getting held every day because we have people that unfortunately still subject to COVID. We have people out on FMLA. We have people out on parental. So just the life stuff that happens, it is having an impact. Um, are the are the twelve hour shifts are those a barrier to hiring also? That's a good question. So we changed our shifts. We used to have eight hour days and ten hour days. Um, we changed to twelve hour shifts to model the fire rescue um, schedule because we had to start learning fire dispatch. So that's why we changed to twelve hour shifts. So now. Uh, the staff doesn't want to go back. So that's fine because you work 14 days a month. But when you're talking to people to try to hire them, okay, 12 hours, that sounds good, but do I really want to be there for 12 hours? So that's where that balance is coming into play. Some people, yes, some people, no. That's interesting. So the, so the 12 hours, they, t they prefer the 12 hour arrangement once they're in, but it might also be a barrier at the point of hiring. Correct. That's interesting, and maybe where the where the internships and the zooms with the dispatcher, those having those opportunities for conversations maybe come come into play. Right. So they work twelve hour shifts for three days a week. How does that work? So it's a two two three. So two on two off. So it's every other weekend off. So they work fourteen days a month. Okay, fourteen days a month. I mm -hmm. get that. Okay. Um, I also have some questions about SSD and so oh, on, but I, I don't know if, okay. Um, so, so shifting over, um, in conversations with community stakeholders and a number of community partners, it's come up um, several times uh, about that uh, our SSD, our security services division and the importance of that and um, the desire for more support from there, um, as well as the urban district staff, uh, the red shirts. Um, so I was just wanting, to get a better idea of how staff, um, how you all see them contributing to the public safety ecosystem, um, uh, you know, how we deal with shortages there, what the shortages and vacancies look like. If, if we could just speak to that, that would be helpful. So uh, we find the uh, Security Services Division a very important at, uh, component of our, our department. Uh, they play uh, significant roles throughout the many different uh, governmental buildings that we have in the in the county, um, and many of them, of course, are 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 hired security officers by the police department. Um, but there's also supplemental staff that's actually contracted, um, and um, again. The more eyes um, that we have um, in many of our governmental buildings and um, um, presence, we think it's it's a vital uh, piece to safety um, in Montgomery County. Now, I will state that there, you know there's um, we've we've done extensive work with our camera systems throughout the county, um, and there's a lot of work still need to be done. Uh, but when we look at our staffing. Um, I can just tell you the demands are growing um, and because again um, the climate that we're currently in I don't know if the climate will change when I say the many aspects of the political climate um, dealing with sometimes mental health issues um, at some of our, our locations um, you know and uh, this is something that we've been addressing over time with so whether it be a library um, whether it be, um, again, um, you know, whether it's the council office building, the executive office building, or our other local regional centers throughout the county are examples where, again, um, we provide more services to our community, but there's also a greater need to have to make sure that our employees um, and those who are visiting those uh, locations are safe as well. Um, and so that, and they again provide those additional eyes and ears for us as the police department should we have to respond to address. They are not equipped to, to handle, um, you know, uh, things that uh, from a public safety as far as um, many of them don't have arrest powers. Um, they are really just there as a presence. Um, and so, uh, but we work with them, we train them. Um, in many of the aspects of some of the basic functions of which they do. 
Um, but I will tell you again, it's a growing demand. Yeah, so I mean, I've certainly been hearing the growing demand from the community myself. Um, do we have any, do you have any specific numbers or details that you can give us to give us a better idea of what the staffing situation looks like in that department? Of, of course, I'm not speaking about contract, you know, our contractual folks. But, uh, we can get those numbers to you. I, we don't have anything um, at this moment, but we can get you what their staffing levels look like and, again, what are some of the demands. Plus, we can add the uh, what we provide from a contract basis as well to support uh, the, uh, the different uh, locations which we serve. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Um, and if I could circle back, actually, to you were discussing how um, it, as you are filling, you know, the needs to fill the specialized roles and using kind of an analysis framework to figure out which ones need to be filled right away and which ones we can delay to keep people on patrol. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that or let us know what are some of the those specialized roles um, that you have delayed in filling, um, whether that is because it wasn't mission-centric or because you've been able to replace or to supplement due to technological advances or, you know, anything like that? Yeah, uh, the, the main, I think the main focus has been, again, is to see if we can, again, afford uh, to disperse the work that's required of, of the different units. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not going to be, it's not a safety issue, um, and it's not pretty much an overload of the, of the work itself, the significance of it. So, for example, I may say that, um, I use an example of a, a district detective, um, where the workload is maybe in a district that it's less. Um, uh, compared to like the third district, for example, um, which is your in your district is one of the is the busiest police district in the county, mm -hmm. um, and they have more detectives assigned to that particular uh, investigative uh, unit than most other detectives throughout the rest of the county. And so, for example, if I looked at the first district, which is our lowest level of, of calls for service in crime. Um, they have a low, a lower number of detectives in that particular unit. So if we have had cases where I've not filled the positions in the first district, um, had they left because of that, of their workload. But, in, but if I looked at the third district and I saw that there was the need that we needed to have because of the workload, then I would fill, we would fill those slots. Um, so again, we take it case by case basis, um, and again, I want to make sure that we are not negatively impacting the community in any way. And for example, in our Special Victims Investigations Division, which oversees our domestic violence, um, child abuse, um, runaway section, and a variety of other um, important roles, um, they have a high workload. Um, and so, based upon their particular heavy workload, I am more prone to fill those positions should one become vacant than I would be, for example, in our, let's say, the narcotics investigative section. Um, because, just because of, again, what is the main focus that we're, we're working on. And even in the narcotics world, um, you know, I've been, we've been working with Assistant Chief Augustine um, and Captain Paserno over special investigations because the opioid, um, you know, epidemic that we're going through where we're seeing this increase in fentanyl, um, you know, I don't want to take our, our finger off the pulse there, um, not, you know, knowing that that's a very important issue. And I have, I made a commitment really um, you know, that we would send a narcotics investigator to every overdose um, that we respond to, that we get a call for, um, in order to have them not focus on the individual who has overdosed or, you know, or, or we are, is being treated, but we're looking for the supplier of the fentanyl, of the drugs that are actually causing these individuals. And we have had some success. Again, I don't want to lose that momentum, but that's a heavy workload for those investigators. But again, if, we look, if I'm looking at tiering, right, what is important, 
those are the things that come to, to my mind. How am I addressing that in order to, again, be able to make, to provide the best service possible to our community in order to, to, to maintain our, you know, approach um, in a very effective manner. Thank you for sharing how you, how you think about that. That's helpful. Um, when we get the formal departmental staffing plan, so, which is listed, I think, on uh, Circle 4 as being in development, um, it would be, it'd be great to be able to, to get your analysis on, on how, how this thinking has informed what that looks like. And also just wanted to confirm um, that we'll have that available to us you know, well in advance of the final vote on the FY24 budget. Yes, you should have that in advance of that. That's correct. Great, thank you. Um, and then last question, I think, for now. Um, how much has the cost of housing um, and other elements of the cost of living uh, impacted the ability to recruit and retain employees? Um, I will, uh, you know, I think we've had this uh, discussion for many years mm -hmm. um, that uh, the cost of living here in Montgomery County um, and the cost of housing is, has a very uh, negative impact on, on make sure that we can keep people at least living in the county. Um, and we do have, um, I think, about 40% of our, our workforce that actually lives outside of Montgomery County, maybe higher, right? I think it's higher, close probably to 50 plus percent. Um, and um, it's, I mean, it's undoubtedly an issue. Um, and um, I know that, again, uh, Assistant Chief Frank, I know, and I, and we have been working with the FOP on several issues even to help to um, to provide some support um, in, in some ways in dealing with issues as we bargain. But overall, I think um, it is something I think, you know, I know the council last year provided a tax uh, benefit, which was, which was, again, I think our members are very grateful of that, those who exist and we're hoping that that's an attraction to bring more people to come to Montgomery County and want to be a, be a part of our department as another, um, you know, benefit being here. Did our civilian folks benefit from that as well? And it, yeah. That's correct, yes. So, um, but, you know, again, it, it's not lost on us that we realize that when we're recruiting, particularly when we're recruiting from outside of the DMV, um, you know, and, you know, I'll, I'll speak to myself as an example. I came here from Richmond, Virginia. I came as a I was a college student, um, and when I came from Richmond, I didn't realize I knew it was a higher cost of living. I didn't know it was this high, um, you know, when I got here. But you you know, but at the same you know, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, at the same time, but it's it's a rude awakening in some. So we have to sometimes do our very best in our recruitment um, processes to make sure that people have a soft landing so that they kind of understand that this, you know, you're going to be moving to a higher, you know, rent um, and housing is more expensive um, in this, um, in the in the area uh, in which you're going to be uh, coming to live. Um, and so that way, you know, we provided some mentorship of people so that they understand that that is, that is a, you know, that is different here. So the salary, more than likely, coming from wherever else, like me coming from Richmond, Richmond could not compete with the starting salary of this police department um, when I started today, when I started 38 years ago versus um, even today, they can't, they're, not, they're not on the same level as us. So. Thank you. Okay. Good. Council member. All right, back to the ECC. Um, so you, you'd mentioned earlier um, folks needing a better sense of when to call 911 or 311 from a non-emergency number, et cetera. Um, in terms of the shifting policies that have happened here with MCPS and the SRO program, um, I met a dispatcher in the community who had discussed the level of increased calls to the ECC that happened as a result of that. And I wanted you to speak to that and the impact it had on operations at the ECC. Yes, it significantly impacted us. Um, so what we had to do as a, re or what I did as a result is create a special phone line uh, for them if it's non-emergency. Now, if it's 911, they'll still call 911. 
um, but that is where they will call that number directly, whether it's calling out a fire drill or a non-emergency situation. So they do utilize that phone number. Um, I'd have to get those statistics. I did have those written down, but mm -hmm. they have been significant. And depending what is occurring during that day, it could be even higher. So we can guarantee without a doubt at least 25 calls a day. But it could be repeatedly um, depending from which school things are going on. So assistant chief, you have anything? Okay. I was going to say is if it's possible and I you know understanding that there may be uh, reasons why certain data can't be you know uh, shared publicly but trying to discern um, you know regional spots where calls for services to the schools may be of a higher volume um, and that may be impacting um, time to delivery of service as well right um, and those are things that that should be thought through in terms of understanding what the best uh, public safety posture is for any given school community. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, denial of service attacks impacting 911 operations. Um, I know that's just such a popular thing these days um, and I wanted to to see how that was impacting your particular operations. Right, so since this is a public environment, I can't get right. too much into the weeds. However, um, the county is very robust in their cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. Would it be fair to say then rectified quickly but still experiencing? Correct. Okay, thank you. And that was extremely diplomatic. I'm, I'm very, and I'm very impressed. I really, Ms. Frog, was there anything else that we need to go through this back at all? No, if you don't have any further questions, I will get back with the department and other executive agencies to get the follow-up information that you've requested. Any other questions from us? If not, thank you all again for doing everything that you're doing. You never get enough thanks, and we're most appreciative. So. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Chief, did you have something? You, 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 you're going to let me stop it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you.